Um, firstly, many thanks for the invitation to take part in this, frankly, very impressive cycle of talks. Um, what I would like to address is more urban issues in relation to our work. But to do this, I've arranged a presentation around the two questions that I was asked by you. Firstly, how do we investigate urban forms and teach design in our teaching practices? But secondly, how urban studies become a component of the design activity um, in practice and to illustrate those in, in, in projects. And the lecture that I will give this afternoon is entitled A Case for the Urban. So really what I want to stress is that my, perhaps it's apparent from the introduction that was just given, but my activities are primarily based in architectural practice. We have, as Sergis and Bates architects, as the main studio remains in London, but since uh, 2012, I've been based in Zurich where we have a second studio. And it should also be added more recently, we have a studio in Brussels. My other uh, career is as a teacher, and frankly, I taught for longer than I've been in practice with Stephen Bates. Um, as was mentioned, I have taught in many schools of architecture, but uh, since 2008, I've been a full professor at the Academy of Architecture in Mendrisio. So this afternoon, this is the closest I get to being with you in Rome. Um, I have always liked this photograph by the German artist photographer Thomas Struth. This is, of course, of the city that most of you who, I guess, are joining this event are in at the moment. For me, it offers a wonderful image of urbanity, one that I find very instructive. The sense in which a city can be made by one building being added in relation to ones that preceded it, but in a manner that is respectful and typologically similar. In this lecture, I will refer to projects that we have built or are working on in our London or Zurich studios. But before I begin to get to grips with that, while Thomas Struth's photograph of Rome offers an in interesting lesson in urbanity, my formation as an architect um, was uh, the result of studying and working in London. And London is a city that has, in contemporary terms, a rather chaotic urban character. But in the Georgian period, it was built in a manner that I find wonderful. It employed four house types as a basis for making city. Priority was given to the house as a means of creating um, an urban expansion of the city. And it works with this notion that I think is evident in this photograph by um, Hélène Binet of uh, a building of repeated elements, which at first glance are exactly the same, but through the inaccuracy of building reveal differences. So this tension between repetition and specialness is something that I have learned from this experience. But to really begin with our work, I start with this project, one that was recently completed in Hampstead in North London. It is a project that is certainly very ambitious in plan, the manner in which it organizes 
a plan as a constellation of rooms of different shapes and sizes. And the manner in which the plan has evolved has been a lengthy process of study and adjustment, both in plan and more three-dimensionally. Here, the evidence of the completed project and more precise plans that talk about the organization of a number of the apartments. But this project also, in more urban terms, derives from our readings of the older arts and crafts buildings that were built in this area of North London. An example can be seen here on the left, or our own relationship to the mansion block, a building type that we have reinterpreted in contemporary terms, just to say a few words on this. So at a point where it was clear at the end of the 19th century that to continue building the city only with terraced houses was not adequate in terms of creating a greater density. So at this point in the UK, the, the, the search was more to continental models of housing and what emerged is this very particular London interpretation of um, horizontal living and, as I say, the mansion block. Here in our work with this project, massing studies that document the rather exhaustive studies that we made. This is not indeed a, a de definitive, but a rather partial um, uh, collection of uh, study, study models, but here more specifically we're looking at the horizontal registers that were introduced as a device to reduce the scale of a building in relation to the neighboring buildings. Not surprisingly, this is also a project that addresses the need to create density in London. In these recent photographs by David Grandwood, of the project finally completed, it holds a feeling of permanence, something that is a common interest in many of our housing projects, as well as seeking a strong urban presence and maybe a certain timelessness. Our work and interests have from the outset addressed urban questions. Here, early texts written by Stephen Bates and I, the text on the right, as you can see, is entitled A Way to Work, and the text on the left, A View of How Things Are. These are papers that imply that it is necessary to learn by drawing upon things that exist and act in relation to the lessons that cities hold, to learn from looking, and then later interpreting, but in a critical manner. Between the house and the city. Our earliest projects were small and discrete additions to the urban and sub suburban situations that we found ourselves working in, invariably London. Here, an example of a reinterpretation of the London terraced house. Or again, in perhaps a more um, ambiguous fashion, a studio house in a street in the East End of London. Here, the front facade of that project. Or a slightly larger project, which involved the repurposing of a former um, industrial building, the creation of this six story building at the end, and the addition of a floor of housing on the older industrial building. These are all projects that add to the city at a small to medium scale, but with a certain intensity. 
So throughout our work, and certainly more recently, our relationship to the European city is one that um, situates our projects. To say that we're the most at home working in the widest understanding of the Euro European city must also take account of the diversity and the complexity of these conditions and situations. Almost invariably, the tasks we find ourselves addressing lie at the margins of cities or places that house relatively large new building types, shopping centers, warehouses, and sites that need to reconcile the impact of transport infrastructure, road, rail, tramways, with their associated noise issues, brownfield sites, and the need to repurpose older industrial buildings. These are parts of the city that can more readily absorb growth and densification, but they are often lacking in urban qualities. They have a ubiquitous character, and in the past, the planning and building of these parts of the city has often been unstructured. The historical center of cities remains important in terms of collective memory. It is the place that offers a shared image of city, but it, is, it rarely offers a setting for contemporary work. If we can agree that any city is a work in progress, an inevitable state of incompleteness, the historical center of the European city is the most protected and on occasion renders it the status of a living museum. To build here is wonderful, challenging, and frankly, ever so rare. In 2010, we won a competition in, at the center of Mendrisio, the city I teach in, and it is a as you might know, a small city in Ticino in the south of Switzerland. Through the introduction of a new public building, which would serve as a city library and a piazza, and further measures that we developed to reorganize the wider situation. This is a project that 12 years later, we're still working on. It makes a point about the work that deals with heritage issues. Another example, a project lying near the historical center of Geneva, another Swiss city. It has resulted in a new corner building accommodating community and housing uses. It was a project that was undertaken with Jean-Paul Jacquot, an architect in Geneva. And the building consciously seeks a form of reconciliation between the two neighboring buildings. The building on the left of the slide, the image on the left, the 19th century school, and on the image on the right, an office and commercial building from the 1960s. So in this work, there was a rather deliberate attempt to reconcile the very different architectures of the neighboring buildings. A project that the London studio is currently working on, situated in Munich, where we're adding to and adjusting an existing triangular urban block. This is a project that like many others, explores housing solutions to the contemporary imperative for urban densification. And an image that is explored in the different facades can be seen as attempting to be respectful of the older traditions of building that are encountered. And also, um, a project that the London office is working on currently is a, a project entitled Citygate in Brussels. Here, this is a much bigger urban task, uh, a work of 
a larger consortium of um, practices that, that are working in collaboration with us. It was recently pointed out to me by Tony Fretton that every city throughout its history has its own relationship to modernity. At every moment in time, a city is a modern version of itself. Conservation and heritage are, after all, relatively recent disciplines. This image records work that we have been involved in uh, over the last 25 years in London. The recent death of Richard Rogers reminds us of his position, which supported an ambition to contribute to the building and the rebuilding of the City of London. At the time, Richard Rogers headed, headed the Architecture and Urbanism Department. It later became known as Design for London. And in rather characteristic fashion, he surrounded himself with younger, talented people who were often our contemporaries. People like Mark Grayley, Eleanor Fawcett, Tobias Colbert, and Tim Rettler, who in turn invited us to work on projects that were at a very large urban scale, mostly in the East End of London and often undertaken in collaboration with East Architecture, Landscape and Urbanism, our friends, uh, another practice. This seemed to us at the time like an exciting moment for London, a city that was preparing for the Summer Olympics in 2012 and redefining its future role as a world city. Our experience of working on projects in continental Europe, however, exposes us to another form of urban governance where every site has a defined set of limits that have come from democratic forms of agreement. And this is a huge in investment. Here, our work in Friam Nord in Munich, this project is in the first instance, a strategy plan for uh, 57, uh, 57 hectare sites. And it will offer homes for, in, in the coming years, uh, 25,000 people and 7,500 places of employment. The project strategy is organized around a series of loose fit perimeter blocks. It is also a project undertaken in collaboration in this instance with Bureau Krucke, who are based in uh, Zurich and Munich, Hilden Kahn and Studio Vulcan. Like the urban projects of Heinrich Tessenhoff, it offers a somewhat picturesque urban character. Every parcel of land in Switzerland has a very precise set of urban rules that must be respected. This makes development clearer and less speculative. These photographs document, document over time, and they're all taken from exactly the same place, a process of change. The building profiles that you might be able to see um, on the screen and the image on the top right represent a very Swiss way of informing the general public about the scale of a project that is in the process of being assessed by the planning departments. In German, they're what are called Bauprofile. Here in a project that we are currently working on in the east of Switzerland, in a town called Arbonne. It is possible with larger projects to undertake revisions to the urban codes, but this involves a lengthy democratic process. So our work here in Arbonne, lying to the east of Switzerland, is an example of this possibility. We are working on a project to create a new urban block that is denser 
um, and a little bit taller than the existing rules allow for. The building is arranged on the ground floor with a, a shopping mall and on the first floor it supports employment uses around the courtyard and from the first floor up the corners um, will house residential uses. The facades indicate the scale of the building in relation to the neighbours. And this interior shows an apartment and by going higher the wonderful views that the apartments will offer towards Lake Constance and the distant mountains. At this point, I'd like to place a little bit more attention on my activities as a teacher. As I already mentioned, teaching has always occupied a considerable amount of my working life. Um, in 2019, I founded in Mendrisio a new institute, an institute that addresses urban and landscaping issues. And I am the director of this institute. But my work more generally as a professor in Mendrisio since 2008 has focused on housing and urban questions. Between 2017 and 2020, over six semesters, my teaching studio in Mendrisio pursued systematically the task of creating an urban plan for Zurich, Switzerland's largest city. In the next 20 years, the city <coughs> anticipates a 25% increase in population, which means approximately 100,000 people. It should be said, however, that uh, Geneva um, is a currently much denser city than Zurich. It's sometimes something like three or four times denser, followed by Basel, which is twice as dense as Zurich. So even with this level of growth, zero extensification seems feasible and sustainable. The question is not whether it can reach the density of other Swiss cities, but it is very much, the research is very much asking the question, how can densification happen without compromising the original urban qualities of the city? And indeed, to take the greatest efforts to make sure that all members of society can be housed within this program of densification. Following a recent national referendum, Swiss cities are no longer allowed to spread indefinitely into the surrounding land. They are compelled by law to remain within their existing municipal and territorial limits and therefore to become more compact and to become denser. This is to safeguard land in order to support agriculture, forestry, and a general sense of amenity. Our work is also um, con conditioned by this recently approved uh, um, strategy plan, um, which is the basis for the future planning of Zurich. It is a policy document um, that will uh, help uh, shape the, the future planning, the near future planning of the city of Zurich. So initially we undertook over six semesters a program of looking at every area of the city. The students made collectively this one to a thousand model of all of the city. Um, this is, in fact, this, the model in an inc incomplete state. And over six semesters, um, we considered this question of how the city 
can expand. The result of six semesters work by my calculations is something like 120,000 hours of work. The students um, often worked in pairs and then as a group of say 24 students working on each semester. So this is the work of one semester working in this instance um, in the area more to the north of the city in um, an area called Erlikon and Schwamerding and, and um, pairs of students began exploring where there were cases to be made for creating uh, a new form of densification. But every semester started by looking more carefully at the existing buildings. This is a, a study of building patrimony. Um, but um, in each case, students not only documented photographically these examples of build, uh, notable buildings from the past, but they also drew very precisely the buildings uh, this act of survey it, through my own um, uh, view is a, a very instructive way of, of getting to know something better. From this form of survey, work shifted into um, a, a work that was looking at strategies revolving around heritage, movement, public realm, public building, buildings related to employment and housing. We would acknowledge that no city solves the needs of a growing population by building only housing. And here, later on in the semester, more refined work that's looking at a more typological um, form of study, looking at variants for one particular site that two students were working on. And uh, my insistence um, that the projects eventually get to a level of detail where they describe not only the atmosphere of buildings, but also the character of places that the buildings form, the background to. So here are many examples of the work of my students in Mendrisio. And on occasion, We've also, also set a task of another form of survey, which is to help perhaps understand more precisely the nature of domestic space. In the slides that you can, the slide you can see on the screen at the moment, the smaller images are a photograph of an existing residential place. And the larger images are photographs of a model made by the students that as accurately as possible, recreates the atmosphere of the original space. And at the end of the semester, that sort of search for um, a contemporary domestic architecture is uh, represented by images that the students produced, typically seen here on the screen. In 2021, we secured a Swiss National Science Fund um, project. I'm currently working with Professor Tom Avamate, who is the chair of the History and Theory of Urbanism at ETH, GTA, and Irina Davidovich, who's the director of the GTA archive. And with my own institute, we're also working with two PhD students and a postdoc student. So in very simple terms, Tom is, Tom Avamati's contribution is a retrospective form of analysis, um, a historical study looking at how the codes and conventions of the city have been applied in the last two centuries to arrive where it is today. And my interest is much more in the project that looks at forms of propositional planning, where we will continue to develop this fantastic foundation that was created by my students for uh, concepts for the future growth of the city. 
Uh, it should be also added that we're working very closely with the city of Zurich and the canton, and we're supported by a larger team of experts, advisors. So this is really an image of how Zurich, Zurich appears today, and an image that was created by one of my teaching assistants that absorbs all of the work of this six, six semester period <coughs> to show the students' projects inserted within the city, um, just to show it again, if now and later. The point being made in such an image that our advocacy is the intrinsic qualities that Zurich holds should not be questioned. It is really a process about accurate and um, detailed projects, specific addition, but with a sense of an overall vision for what Zurich might be in 2040. <clears throat> Returning to the interests that are held in, in our own um, studio, the theme of adding to and adjusting the space between. Now, while the buildings that we have built or are currently working on invariably are adding to an existing place, they're also informed by readings we make of place and the wider urban setting, working with the city and the house in the city. So from our point of view, urbanism can really be defined a little bit like the point that I was making in relation to that photograph by Thomas Trude, can be defined as a moment where something is added to something that can be seen to have been there before. This relationship between something that exists and something that anticipates a future relationship. Our work on Seven Sisters Road in North London arranged three new buildings, which are um, varying in heights. The ones to the street are really um, urban villas. And they established a certain interdependence on one another, <coughs> as well as an accuracy in terms of the relationship they hold to the older neighboring buildings. It was a project that I remember when it was completed was described in the architectural press as being, the word that sticks in my memory was scary, um, but I must say I, uh, see many examples of buildings in London today that explore similar um, interests. Here in Nord Bahnhof in, in Vienna, uh, a project that was also undertaken in collaboration with uh, Werner Noeth, a Viennese architect, and what was at the time um, the Zurich office of von Barmos Kurka. At a first meeting in London, we agreed as these three offices, the set of guidelines that each studio would explore. Um, it was the result of um, an interest, a shared interest in how we could add to the city, but in a way that celebrates proximity and difference and sameness all at the same time. The decision to place the entrances towards the inside, not the outside of the three volumes, was one of the guidelines that we agreed, but also that each building volume would work with two facets to an otherwise orthogonal form, and also reductions at the top of the building amongst other issues that we were exploring. <clears throat> Here you can see the plan of this cluster of three buildings. Here, a project in Zurich, where the space between is understood as a measure of the size of the inner courtyard, the manner in which a perimeter is adjusted to sit within this part of the city, absorbing the geometry that exists in the current perimeter and the reoccurring interest in the lessons learned from older precedents, particularly in this city. In the same city as the 
project for the new urban block that I showed earlier, an interest in type and urban morphology, always a con something that conditions our work and evident again here. A further example of a project that considers the space between new buildings, new housing buildings, sitting on this site with a fantastic relationship to Lake Constance. With this competition, um, there were issues that we explored in plan, which um, uh, I think have helped inform our knowledge of the project that um, we're also uh, working on, the one that I showed you uh, earlier. But they also informed this um, relatively recently completed project in Seibach, which is a suburb of Zurich. Um, the site for this project lies near the limits of the city. And two clients working collaboratively invited solutions for their sites as one bigger overall um, site. This allowed for a level, greater level of density, but also a, a greater level of closeness than boundary distances would normally allow for in the urban codes. And so what emerged as a, an interest from the competition was this notion again of the space between what the Smithsons uh, referred to as the charge void. Each building has a small difference in specification, but the details and expression are the same. The buildings are arranged around vertically aligned uh, brick slips uh, with precast concrete elements, corner balconies, um, which break the largely orthogonal geometries of the plan and a reduced attic floor that really stems from a building law. The buildings now sit within a landscape designed by Muller Ilian, a landscape architect in Zurich. And the theme of in between this is also employed in the interior planning where a combination of orthogonal secondary rooms and looser representative spaces are arranged in the apartments. The last theme is landscape settlement strategy, um, an interest in working at a much larger scale and more strategically scale has already been acknowledged, although it is an interest that we have frankly always had. Working here again in collaboration with EAST, we developed a project for a competition entry to extend sitting born a town in uh, a county to the east of London. We proposed within what is a sort of polar landscape, a flat landscape, a network of, of buns, forms that we encountered in the landscape when we visited it for the first time. And our designs revolved around these as a, a servicing landscape infrastructure rather than an idea for the building that would be built later on in time. So it was really a, um, a concept that was um, much more about a landscape infrastructure. In this sense, it's a project that's really indebted to Florian Beigel and Philip Christo and the Architecture Research Lab, but also in part to Alvaro Caesar and his work in Evera, that I'll return to in a moment. When we were working on the project in Stevenage, which is um, more explicitly about house and type, a revision to the semi-detached house, you can see the example on the left, something like three million of these houses were built between 1920 and 1930. It was in time more or less the suburban housing solution in the UK. And in working on this project, we were also interested in how a revised version of this housing type could also create settlement. 
The double house is a low density housing solution that continues to fascinate us. Here, an example of a recent competition entry in DTCon near Zurich. <coughs> Heinrich Tessanov also reminds us of the possibilities of making a house that is house-like, something that has certainly influenced the small housing settlement we worked on with um, a developer in Aldershot, the south of London. That's a good argument. Yes, I've almost finished. Um, here, the example of Tesnov. But also we found ourselves looking at span housing, um, drawing upon the lessons of Eric Lyons and the notion of homes within a garden. So here, this more recent example of our interest in the semi-detached house. And finally, this project that is a long way from the previous one, a project that we've been working on for many years um, within a master plan created by the Lisbon Office of Promontorio, <coughs> and also a landscape architect and colleague of mine at the Academia, Jao Gunes, who's based in Lisbon. Our work was an invitation to create 10 houses uh, as a cluster, working alongside uh, a number of uh, wonderful uh, colleagues. But in our work in Alentejo, we were naturally um, fascinated by the work of Alvaro Cesar and his wonderful master plan for the expansion of Evora, but also his earlier work, such as the Carlos Cesar house, which works with the theme of a patio. Here, three of the types that we developed for this project, which is ever so slowly being built. And finally, some very last words. We state that it is important to uphold an architecture that is responsible, that architects as architects, we're interested in the responsibilities demanded of architecture. But what do we mean by this? That our work is conditioned in general and has a social and a societal function and should not and should always seek a humanist character. When we employ construction, we should always be seeking the most sustainable answers and in the making of buildings, they should be resilient and conditioned by their means. 